नमस्ते एंड वेलकम टू माय चैनल सो वी आर गोइंग टू कंटिन्यू विद द सीरीज ऑन फेशियल नर्व पॉलिसी इन द फर्स्ट वीडियो वी हैव सीन द एनाटॉमी एंड गॉट एन एंड ओवरव्यू ऑफ द इंटायर पाथवे दैट इज द इंट्रा क्रेनियल एज वेल एज द एक्स्ट्रा क्रेनियल पाथवे ऑफ द सेवेंथ क्रेनियल नर्व दैट इज द फेशियल नर्व इन दिस वीडियो आई एम गोइंग टू क्विकली गेट अ रीकैप ऑन वॉट आर द क्लिनिकल साइंस एंड सिम्टम्स वेन अ फेशियल नर्व पेरालिसिस अकर्स how do you identify the level of the lesion and what are the basic tests that we do for the same so now there is an easy mnemonic which i remember for the etiopathogenesis of any condition which is ctin that means the causes of facial palsy can be congenital traumatic inflammatory or infective or neoplastic now whether this is an upper or lower motor neuron lesion we will see how to differentiate between those two but these are the broad categories under which all of the common causes will fall now especially in case of plastic surgery we are going to encounter cases of congenital facial palsy and uh, even those that are inflammatory or they are surgical that is when they have occurred due to trauma whether it is iatrogenic or it is um, inflicted so those are the kinds of treatment that we will deal with there are a lot of uh, ent causes as well in case of facial nerve palsy and a lot of neurosurgical causes as well now if it is upper motor or lower motor neuron lesion what is the telltale sign now we have seen the anatomy of the facial nerve and therefore we have seen the uh, nucleus of the facial nerve and where it lies and after seeing the intra as well as the extra cranial course of this nerve we are aware of the different types of functions that it provides and if we know that it is a mixed nerve which has a sensory component as well as a motor component and in addition to that it also has certain special features that it provides for example the taste sensation but when we are talking about um umn or lmn the thing that we have to remember is the representation of the facial palsy so in this diagram you can see that we are seeing the level of the cortex and this is the level of the motor neurons now when it is an upper motor neuron lesion then what is going to happen is that on the contralateral side only the lower half of the face will be affected and the upper part will be spared that means this patient will still be able to raise his or her eyebrows and will not have that much of the function of the orbicularis oculi affected the main difference that you see is at the level of the forehead where the wrinkling will still be present in this case of an upper motor neuron lesion whereas in case of a lower motor neuron lesion on the ipsilateral side that is the same side where the lesion occurs there will be a paralysis of the entire half of the face that is of the hemi face so it is going to affect the upper as well as the lower half that means there will be absent of wrinkling of the forehead which is loss of action of the frontalis muscle and patient won't be able to raise his eyebrow the orbicularis muscle and all the muscles of the lower half whether it is the depressor or the elevators or the buccinator they will all be affected which is commonly seen by drooping of the angle of the mouth dribbling of saliva inability to form a, a tight pursed string of the mouth and inability to whistle now why does this occur commonly we would think that if it is an upper motor neuron lesion that means if it's coming from a higher level that means it should affect all the functions and a lower motor should affect a few functions but that happens when certain branches are given off proximally and distally but in this case it's not so upper motor neuron lesion affects only the lower half of the contralateral side whereas lower motor is going to affect the entire half the reason for this is the bicortical representation of the upper half of the face that is of the forehead so the upper half gets its supply its cortical innervation from both of the cranial nerves from either side for ease of understanding i have drawn just the affected nerve over here but since it will also be supplied from the same side with the innervation it will still maintain its function whereas the lower half of the face gets a unicortical representation from one side of the brain that is the reason why you will be able to distinguish between the umn or the lmn mainly based on whether it is ipsilateral or contralateral and which side of the 
uh, face it is affecting and whether the upper half is affected or not. Now clinically history is very important in all of the patients because especially in case of Bell's palsy if they have had a viral fever, they have had otalgia, tinnitus or they have had vesicular formation around the ears such as in case of Ramsey-Hunt syndrome these are all the telltale signs. Now if they have had the functioning of the 8th nerve also affected there can be a neurological tumor if definitely there is a direct trauma to the head or in cases of injury such as iatrogenic during parotid gland surgery then the facial nerve is also commonly affected. So common things should be remembered first Bell's palsy is the most commonest cause of facial nerve palsy and it is a diagnosis of exclusion. It is seen in up to 70% of cases and the good part is that a lot of patients have almost complete remission by the end of one year. So this is a representation of what happens when the facial nerve palsy occurs. So this side of the face is the one that is affected and this side is the one where all the muscles are acting. So it's always uh, easy for the eye to get distracted onto the functioning side and miss the side which is not functioning. So always remember that the side which has all the movements is the normal side and obviously the side of paresis is the one which is affected. So now there are a lot of muscles, over 17 paired muscles of the face which are supplied by the facial nerve. So those muscles if you review them you will get to know that each and every one is affected and so is their function. But the most common ones that you will see is the loss of wrinkling of the forehead because of the frontalis and again the inability to raise the eyebrow. Now ptosis occurs in these patients again because of the brow ptosis that is seen because of the loss of frontalis action. Now the orbicularis oculi does not function therefore the patient is not able to close his or her eye tightly and that also leads to damage to the cornea which in turn leads to dryness but in some patient it also leads to epiphora that is constant watering from the eyes. Then there is ectropion that is eversion of the lower eyelid which further increases these symptoms. Then there is also loss of the nasolabial fold on the affected side and there is drooping of the angle of the mouth along with dribbling of saliva. Now because of the loss of action of the buccinator muscle, the patient cannot form a tight seal with the mouth and there is constant dribbling which is seen. Now the tests which are commonly described are the shimmer test which is to see the decrease in lacrimation on this side uh, which is affected. Now there is also epiphora like I said so although lacrimation is affected because when the greater petrosal nerve gets affected the uh, lacrimation reduces but because of the uh, ectropion and the constant corneal irritation there may be a reflex epiphora also in a lot of patients. Hyperacusis that is the stapedial reflex which is lost because of the action of the stapedius muscle then there is an abnormal response to loud noises and because of the affection of the parasympathetic innervation of salivation and the corda tympani the special gustatory sensations are also affected. Other than this electrophysiological studies, electrophysiological mapping, MRI of the brain etc are required depending on how the patient presents to us. Now in the case of the eye, especially in Bell's palsy there is an interesting phenomenon also that is Bell's phenomenon occurs that is when the patient attempts to close the eye there is an upward and outward rotation or movement of the cornea. Now this is a protective reflex because the patient is not able to close the eye tightly because of the loss of function of orbicularis oculi. That is a protective response that occurs and it is easily seen in case of people who have suffering with Bell's palsy. Now finally what is synkinesis? So synkinesis is nothing but syn that is the simultaneous movement of two different functions which is due to an abnormal re during the recovery phase of the facial nerve palsy. So basically along with the voluntary movement there is an involuntary function which also occurs because there is a sort of an irregular or haphazard wiring that occurs when the nerve is regenerating. So with the movements of the mouth that is with the chewing there is an inadvertent blinking of the eye on the affected side which is known as the oculo-orosynkinesis and something popularly known as crocodile tears that is when the patient is eating and the salivation occurs then at the same time even lacrimation is stimulated and there is 
tearing from the eyes so that is known as crocodile tears so these are the most common features that we see in case of facial nerve palsy and in the upcoming lectures we will see how to manage them